Hello, everyone. Welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Connected. I am excited for this one for a whole bunch of reasons, but off the top of my head, because I think I've watched the show like three times through now, The Haunting of Bly Manor. We have Oliver Jackson Cohn here with us today. Thank you so much for doing this. No, so thank you for having me. <laughs> You've got a lot. I feel like we, we've we spoken fairly recently, Invisible Man. Now we're going to get to talk about Bly. You have a bunch of other projects that I'm really eager to dig into right now. But before we even get to your filmography, we like to start at the very, very beginning. So was there a specific show, movie, performance, personal experience that you remember making you say, I have to do this. I have to be an actor. Oh, yeah. Uh, Home Alone. Like, I remember, I remember going to the cinema to watch it. And, uh, and, and, and genuinely thinking uh, that I, I, I genuinely having the realization that kids could be actors. I hadn't really ever thought it through and then seeing Macaulay Culkin. So I left the, uh, the movie theater and my dad said they're making a second one. So I decided I must've been like six or seven. And I, so I decided maybe a bit older. Um, <clears throat> I decided that I was gonna be the kid in Home Alone 2. And they didn't really know how I was gonna make that happen. But <clears throat> I would, my parents, they had this house with like a window that gave out onto the street. And, um, and so I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll sit on the end of the dining table up against the window and someone from Hollywood will drive by and go, there's a kid, that's, that's the one that we need. Um, but it was, it, I just became obsessed with it, like obsessed with it from such a young age. And I found it, you know, without sort of it getting a bit dark, but I found it the, the, the only kind of place where you could explore things in such a safe way um, and explore the weirdest kind of parts of uh, humanity in a way. And I think that that's still why I do it, um, just because I love uh, getting lost in a fantasy, I guess it is. I don't know. Oh, I couldn't 100% relate to that. I feel like the movie that made a click for me was Jurassic Park. And really, I mean, what other way are you going to connect to that kind of darkness and fantasy than yeah. to a future film? Yeah, 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 exactly. So Home Alone kind of creates that spark. But how do yeah. you get from that first spark to actually committing to going to school to be an actor? It's one thing to say, I want to be an actor growing up. It's another thing to really commit to pursuing that career. I go backwards and forwards constantly and think, God, you were brave or you were completely stupid. Um, my, um, my, I, I actually kind of arrived quite late. And so I, I went to a French school growing up and they, they weren't, um, it's not it's sort of the French system is not, is not very arts related. And so I had to kind of seek it out outside of school. And um, I start, I found this sort of drama group on a Saturday that I used to go to and, um, and that's kind of where, where I was about 11 or 12. And that was where it really, really got, um, became kind of an obsession. And then it was years until I think I didn't do my first sort of proper job until I was uh, 20. Um, and I'd gone to university, I'd finished high school and, uh, and all I wanted to do was act. And I was told that I should uh, find a proper job um, and that uh, I needed a degree and that's great that you have that sort of fantasy, but um, it's it's probably not going to happen. So go and be sensible. And so I I did. So I went off to university for a year to do a French literature degree and was so insanely miserable. Um, so dropped out and then worked in the shit did like the shittiest jobs um, because because I was I'm going to go to drama school and then I didn't get into drama school uh, on the first try. And so it. Um, it was sort of, it sort of took a while to kind of find, find, like find my way. But then I, I got this, this job for the BBC, this sort of period drama for the BBC. And then just sort of, it just sort of all kind of just sort of fell into place from there, really. Um, yeah. I'm a big fan of asking about bumps in the road because you never know who out there might need to hear your story. Yeah. So you don't get into drama school the first time around. How do you not get dejected and instead refocus on another opportunity? Uh, I think, I, listen, I think that as actors, we, we face rejection a, a huge amount. And, um, 
some of it is incredibly harsh, but but some of it is also important because it does it constantly puts the the doubt in your head of am I this is really stupid? How much should I just stop? Um, but I think that uh, it's will, <laughs> it's will, and uh, I, I don't think that I'm the most confident person or have this sort of an innate belief in myself or, or what I do but but I think that there's there is a part of you that you wouldn't keep on doing something over and over and over again um if you didn't there wasn't a part of you that thought that it would work out um and I understand that 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 doesn't that isn't the case uh always and so I think that if you truly truly believe and you have to be um realistic about you know it's a it's a is a tough job in some ways and is a, an amazing job in so many other ways but i think uh think just just brush it off and move on but i think it is in it is important you know i i feel like i'm not necessarily of the school of thought of like don't listen to your haters or don't listen to because sometimes there'll be that one percent of that that actually makes you think about oh well maybe i should have a look at that or maybe i should um so i'm just rambling now uh, I, well it's also it's not necessarily a question with a clear-cut answer there's so <laughs> there's so many factors and there's so many different paths so i kind of understand yeah. that in this sense yeah i think but i think that ultimately what will happen is that you the path that is the right path for you kind of will show itself and uh and that can take that also doesn't have to be immediate you know i i i was a i worked in in production until I was 21. I was a, uh, when I was 15, I, I did sort of like work experience as a set PA on a, on a sitcom in the UK and then sort of did that for four or five years. And then I went to work for MTV for a while and worked in costume department. So I did all these different jobs knowing full well that what I really wanted was acting. But, um, and it's, I feel like it just kind of, it kind of, plays out how it's supposed to play out in a way without getting too kind of like mythical about the whole thing. Yeah. And it, it, it does sound like you got almost like a mini film school out of that experience too, before yeah. you fully jumped into acting. Yeah. Well, also I just got to like watch actors work, you know, from the sidelines. And um, it was, it was so, I just felt like I learned so much about how a set works and how, um yeah i just i felt like i learned, i just learned so much and it and it definitely pushed me to really try and try with everything i had to make this work out in some way i'm glad you kept at it because you've got a bunch <laughs> of stuff that we need to go through right now first one i have on my list here is going the distance so what was it like being on that set and for all i know at that point you're already a total pro that can keep it together, but I seriously can't imagine jumping on set with someone like Drew Barrymore for your first big feature film. Yeah, it was absolutely terrifying. Um, and also because I hadn't, because, you know, obviously I'm British, um, I hadn't, um, I didn't have a visa. And so Warner Brothers had to get me this visa and I got denied um, because I didn't, I hadn't, I'd only done one job in the UK before. So the specific visa you needed. And so Drew, wrote a letter i'd never met her but she wrote a letter to the immigration visa people so i felt like when i turned up i already owed this person my life like she had there was a whole point where it's like well you're not gonna be able to do the movie because if you can't get the visa in time we can't keep on pushing the dates and so there was a moment where it's like i'm sorry we're gonna have to let this go so it was um i feel like there was so much it wasn't just like this is your first movie and this is your first studio movie and you're working with this like you know like america's sweetheart um yeah it was a lot it was a lot of pressure but she is she 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 was she was so wonderful to work with and and so supportive and um yeah she's she's really quite a special i mean i know she now has a show so everyone can kind of see just how like genuinely she just exudes kindness and so it was um it was it was great to work with her feel like her getting that other show amongst other opportunities is the only reason I'm okay with the cancellation of Santa Clarita Diet, which I'm actually still not okay with, but Netflix gives me a lot of content. I can't complain right now. The other movie I'm dying to ask you about is Faster. So you go, what? You you make that face. So you, so you make that face and I feel like I, ha I ha have an understanding of why, but okay. I really do feel like that character, it's like the blueprint was there 
and I would have liked to have spent more time with him, like in the cracks in his composure. And I wanted to understand more. I think that with that character, I remember being really, really excited. Listen, it was such an insane opportunity. I'd done this, you know, this tiny show in the UK for the BBC, and then it got this sort of small part in this movie with Drew. And then this was the follow up a couple of weeks later. And it was a sort of, you know, one of the three leads in this movie with, you know, Billy Wolf Thornton and Dwayne Johnson and, uh, you know, George Tillman directed it, who he, he was he's like, was a phenomenal director. And so it was, again, it was like, oh my God, there's all of this pressure. <laughs> but um, I felt like what ended up happening is that, that, the the character went through so many different changes and I don't know necessarily if I uh, was bold enough at the time to sort of say this doesn't feel right this doesn't and there was a whole part of um, that character if I remember correctly that was supposed to be on like medication and and then and then that was sort of then there was the they, there was a test that they did with an audience and then they said oh we can't so it just felt like I just remember watching it and just thinking, what the hell is going on with this dude? He's insane. <laughs> I, can, I can understand that. So what would you say is the value of a learning experience like that? Oh, when you, you're, you're an actor, you got to jump in and do your work the yeah. way that it's described to you. And you don't necessarily have control over those things. So from that experience, is there anything you can apply to other roles, whether it's in the casting process or even after the fact now? I think it was it was such an such a good learning experience, you know, and, and um, I had so little experience as well. Uh, and so I was sort of still finding my feet. And, and I do it, what it did do that movie did do for me is it is it made me uh, I was sort of raised to be uh, sort of obedient and compliant. So I was told if the director asks you to do something, you do it. You don't question it. You do it. Um, and and not that this was the case with with one faster, but I, I think that I just was sort of trying so many different hats on that I ended up wearing all of the hats, and um, and I I it made me it sort of taught me to to sort of trust myself a bit more and trust what I felt was right or what I felt was um, yeah what I felt was was right, and so it was. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm genuinely not going to lie, but I, I am mortified <laughs> whenever, like, whenever it comes on, like, on, uh, like, whenever I'm like flicking the channels and it's on TV, I'm like, that, quick, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. Um, but it, but it was, it was a great thing. I think it was a great experience to have that because it, you know, I, I used because I didn't get into drama school. I used those first like five years of my career were my drama school. It was me making mistakes. It was me trying things out that didn't work, but on a scale that was a bit less forgiving than just in like a quiet room. Um, but it was, it was, they were very, very important, important. It was a very kind of important learning process. All of those, that, that kind of early stuff. Is there any particular credit show or film where you noticed that you had a very clear understanding of what you wanted to accomplish as an actor and the control you had over the trajectory of your career? I think there was a bit of a turning. I mean, I say that, you know, the first the first sort of five or six years of my career, you, the reality is, is what well, you do the jobs that you're offered. You know, you don't you, it's not like this whole thing of like, I am now I'm going to hold out when you're 22 and you've got no money and you really, really want to make this work. You just do whatever you can. Um, and then I reckon about, I think about four or five years ago, there was a there was a, a movie that I did in Australia called The Secret River that never left Australia. It never went anywhere else. Um, but that was the first sort of time that I felt I was able, I wasn't having to be what someone thought I should be. And I was actually able to put my own imprint of, of what I felt was human, what I felt was real into a character. And it was, it was mutually, it was a sort of mutual, uh, we were all on the same page of that. Um, so that was, I think that was the first time that I felt uh, that I was doing something that, um, that felt closer to who I am and felt closer to um, this, the type of, projects or work that I I watch or I relate to. Um, and so there was that. And then um, I did a, a thing for the BBC called Man in Orange Shirt, 
which uh, I don't know if it made it to the US, but um, it was uh, it was a really, really interesting uh, story, a true story about these two men that fell in love during World War Two. And and that, again, was uh, was a, just a, a really, really interesting piece. And, and then funnily enough, I, um, I <laughs> a Hill House, The Haunting of Hill House was, again, after Man and Shirt, I said, I'm not doing things that I don't feel like I can add to or, or give, I feel like someone else should do it because they'll do it better. Um, and so Hill House was the next on the list that came along and, and I really felt, um, no, I can, I can put so much of myself in this. I feel like I've rambled again. <laughs> but you handed me the perfect transition because this brings us to Hill House. So from my limited perspective, Hill House mm -hmm. comes out, it is like next level success. And I look at every single member of that ensemble and I'm like, well, they've got it made now. All these opportunities are gonna come their way. Did it feel like that to you? Um, it definitely felt hugely overwhelming because I think that I'd never worked for Netflix before. So I had no concept of everything coming out at once and the whole word of mouth thing. And so I do remember the weekend that Hill House, I mean, I think we'd done this sort of mini press that we'd only recently wrapped it. And um, I remember watching it and thinking, God, this show is really interesting. I have no idea if anyone's going to like it. Um, and, and then about two weeks after it came out, I just remember going where I li live in London, sort of going, sort of doing the normal trip to like the, the store around the corner and just thinking, oh God, I actually can't walk down this road because, because people are talking to me constantly about, and I thought, oh God, this is a bit weird. So I went back to my house and then it just sort of kept on happening. And I thought, oh God, this show, I guess people are liking it. Um, it definitely felt insanely, um, it, was, it was just incredibly overwhelming, but, but wonderful. I think when you, when you do something that, you know, I, I think what Mike did with The Haunting of Hill House is, was so clever and so kind of groundbreaking in the fact that you're able to tell these stories about grief and loss and addiction and mental illness and family and childhood trauma in the veil of horror is something that I'd, I'd never seen specifically on, you know, on, on a platform like, um, like Netflix before where it was available to a whole world. It was just kind of phenomenal. But I think we all, I remember, I remember saying to a friend of mine, I went, do you think this is it? Do you think this, do you think this is, you know that moment that everyone says, you know, and this is it. And all of a sudden, like the clouds part and you're like that, here I go guys. And just off, I'm just, I'll see you guys later because I'm way too important. And then it's what happens is just, then the phone doesn't ring and then you're like, oh, okay. Well, I guess I'll just sit back down then, I guess. <laughs> But the phone did ring, which is awesome. For, the phone, no, of course, the phone did for ring. a bunch of things, including, <laughs> of course, Bly, which man, it just excites me to no end. I said this to Tania the other day. I was super worried that Hill House was almost too good and got me too attached to that family that I wasn't going to be able to readjust for the anthology format. But no, it clicked, and I fell in love with the ensemble. So, of everyone in the Bly cast. Whose process would you say aligned with yours the most and who challenged you to kind of adapt to what they were doing the most? Oh, wow. Um, I think Victoria Pedretti and I, we, 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 we work, we, we sort of work in a similar way. And um, we have, I think that's why on season one, why we, we, you know, have since become so close. Um, because we, we do approach story the same way. And she's a, a, a sort of an incredibly uh, interesting uh, woman. And um, I think we both, we, 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 we're very, very similar sort of personally as well. So um, I, would, I would say it's more aligned with hers. It was interesting working with um, Tahira who plays Miss Jessel. Uh, I sometimes get quite like obsessive about making everything honest and real and it has, everything has to, um, and she's just so like, we're good. We're just going to be fine. 
just gonna like i'm just gonna say the lines like we don't need to like talk about it before we don't need to like and so it's i, I sometimes think that's quite healthy to have like a dose of both extremes do you know what i mean <laughs> to kind of find a middle ground now we're gonna talk some bly spoilers because okay. i got lots of questions for you and one of the ones that is on the top of my list here is just what was it like collaborating with with benjamin and Maybe more specifically, did that process that the two of you worked out change as production continued and you got more into the characters and what they were going through? Uh, I don't know if the process changed, actually. We, right from the beginning, had a discussion and um, I asked Ben, I said, do you want us to sit down and talk about it? And he said yes. Um, and so... We immediately, before we even started filming, um, talked about mannerisms. And it's quite a hard thing, you know, specifically with what Peter does and asking a kid to do that. Um, so he, he, he's just an incredible actor and, um, and was in incredibly receptive. But what would happen would be is that I would, we would be handed these specific scripts that were um, all the scenes where uh, miles is possessed and so i would sit down with ben and i would read the miles lines as peter and then he would um he would sort of copy what i did and then and then we would go to set and i would come to set on on the days when it was those scenes and i would sort of stand just off camera and and mention things so it became a sort of collaboration between his ideas and my ideas um but he he just I think when you're that age, you know, which is why it's kind of so incredible working with kids of that age is that their imaginations are so great. Um, and I mean, great as in like the size of them. Um, so he, he, um, he was, he was incredibly receptive and, and, uh, and I think he does such a phenomenal job with it. He's too good. But I mean, yeah. both of them, him and Amelie just really blew my yeah. mind. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're just phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal kids. So Mike had said that initially Peter was a more villainous and unsympathetic character. So how much did Peter change for you from first script that you got to what we see in the final show? Uh, a lot. I remember Mike calling me about it. This was way, way, way before when he was pitching the idea. And he said, um, there's two, there's two, there's, there's Victoria's, I think we, I'm going to ask Victoria to play the, the au pair. And then there's two, there's two in the book, there's two characters that you could play. You could either play the groundskeeper or you could play the valet, the evil valet. And I went, oh, okay. And he said, so we'll sort of figure that out. And he, he came to me and he said, it's going to be Peter. And, um, He's the villain. And my first thing was, why? Like, why is he a villain? <laughs> and similar with Invisible Man, um, you know, Lee and I did not want a kind of moustache twirling, oh, Lizzie, we didn't want any of that. It was someone that was incredibly human, that was that made it, incre it, 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 it sort of it, more um, dangerous, like more terrifying because they were so human. Um, and I think the same with Peter, I was interested with Mike, both of us were, in how do we take this person who is supposed to be a villain uh, and have these sort of horrendous qualities and do these horrific things and, uh, and make them real. And, um, and I, I do have this theory, and maybe I'm wrong, but I do think that, um, and hopefully it's clear in the show that, that, you know, Peter had this incredibly rough upbringing and <clears throat> it, damaged him to a point that um, he his will to good and his will to um, sense is um, has, has been permanently damaged. And so we wanted to get across the idea of, of uh, someone that was fully formed that wasn't just the one note villain, that wasn't just... Um, and I think that the only way you can do that is by giving someone heart. And I, I, do, I do feel like it's a, a thing that I that I, I sort of, uh, I feel like I have to do as, as, as an actor with these, with these characters. And, and maybe it's, you know, I, I feel like there are certain jobs that I haven't got because it's not the right thing. And, but, I, but I feel that with Peter Quinn, it was very, very important that we show the, the human aspect of him. And the fact that he has come from something so horrific and 
has never experienced any kind of safety in his life. And then the moment he finds someone that he feels safe with and that he loves deeply, um, he dies. And so what does that do to someone? Like how, you know, is he suddenly in prison for the rest of his life? And so every single, he was just about to start his life. He was just about to get out. He was just about, he had all of this excitement and hope and, um, and it was shattered. And so hopefully we kind of cover that in the show and it's it's sort of um clear in the show you definitely feel it it is very clear in the show and in like the behind the scenes of collider where we're all talking about it after we've watched it you know one of the one of the most like this phrasing feels really simple and broad to me but one of the biggest questions that came up was do you think peter is a bad person and it almost feels like an unanswerable question to me because then it it forces you to judge whether or not someone's good based on their actions now, which could be tethered to how they were treated growing up. And there, there are just a lot of factors in play I'm there. So, I'm so glad because I feel like Mike and I spoke about that a lot um, and about the idea of we wanted it to be ambiguous. We wanted an audience to decide and we wanted an audience to be confused. And we wanted them to jump from, even from in the middle of an episode to going, oh God, he's a piece of shit, to, oh fuck that poor man. Um, so, and I think that it is, that's kind of what we do in, in life. We so there's only so much sympathy. The fact is he does something horrific. He kills the person that he loves. It makes sense to him. And then he attempts to kill these children. Um, and it makes sense to him, but because of his desperation for, for, for what, what it is he's seeking for. But it, um, I, I'm glad, I'm glad that you say that because it, it was an intention to, we were sort of hoping that it would have that effect. It definitely does. So I don't know how much you got into the rules of this ghost world with Mike and everyone, but first question in that department, did you ever envision what Peter goes through after he's killed and he says he goes out and explores? Because as we go on in the season and get to meet some of the other ghosts trapped there, it just started to make me wonder what kind of conversations is he having with the others and what is he learning from them? <laughs> yeah, they all just sort of sit around and play cards. Um, uh, I don't I don't really know. I, I just, I think that there is a scene where, where Peter does say, I've been exploring. And I think that, that Mike likes to play with this idea of time and this idea of, um, I think you see, I mean, you see it in episode five in, in the Mrs. Gross episode that it's just so you're constantly just going into these memories. And, and I think it's something like that, but I think what Peter ends up in is he just ends up in this loop back in the, his apartment with his mum, And then I think it, it just gets darker and darker. And I think that none of it makes any sense, but I think that the way that Peter was raised is that he had to just survive. And so I think when, after he does die, he is just going around and picking up as much information as he possibly can. Um, I don't. I don't imagine that they're all sitting around. And but I think he witnesses all of this stuff. I don't think they're playing poker. I mean, I totally would have watched the whole episode of Peter with a bunch of ghosts playing poker. It would. It, that would have. That would have been a great one. That could have been our episode ten, our, a bonus episode. Sign me up for that. One last question before I let you go. I'm wondering, is there a difference between the you, me, and us that Peter and Rebecca share versus Danny and Viola? Had he not tried to drown her, could they really have gone out into the world like Danny does at the end of the show? Oh, I don't know, actually. That's a, that's a really hard, I feel like that's a Mike Flanagan question. Uh, no, it probably is. <laughs> Ask Victor. Uh... I actually, I really don't know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> don't be sorry. I have many questions for Victoria about the after the fact and what would, specifically what would have happened had she not gone back to Bly and let Viola emerge in the States? Would she just have wreaked similar havoc wherever she was? Or I, lo I love these worlds that Mike built. I mean, and he, and he, it's, it's, it's kind of phenomenal. I mean, and the fact that it, you know, it, it creates so much, uh, such a conversation. It creates, mm -hmm. you know, it, they stay with you, these worlds. That, and the rules that he builds in these worlds. But unfortunately, I feel like I'm not very good at answering, <laughs> answering the questions of the rules. To, to be fair, you're supposed to be limited to Peter's knowledge. <laughs> and in that respect, you answered all my questions. <laughs> before, before I let you go here, just to, to tease your next movie, which I'm assuming is what the tattoos are for, right? 
Oh God, yeah, I'm sorry. I feel like I've been doing all of these and I feel like right at the end of interviews, people have been like, are they real? And I'm like, no, I keep on forgetting. Um, no, they're not, they're not real. This horrific eagle neck tattoo, no. That's, that's a bit, I'm a big fan of tattoos. But that's a, that's a very big one there. Um, I guess this, bigger, we've got, I've got bigger here. Oh, it, wow. It, it, gets, it gets ridiculous. It's kind of fun though, just to have it's great. It's and really good maybe fun. wash off after. <laughs> There's so many people I want to ask you about working with on that movie, but in particular, can you tell me if you get to work with Paul at all? Because I was just reading a quote uh, from him from another outlet, and he said something to the effect that, like, even after the success of Normal People, jumping onto the set of his first feature film, like he's he's absolutely terrified. So, can you sense that at all? And what can you no, do, as someone he... with all the experience, to help him out? He's, he's, I mean, we, we've been in this sort of strange quarantine bubble, um, all of us for, for the past sort of two weeks. And, you know, it turns out when you're on an island in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of strangers, you actually become really quite close very quickly. Um, he's, he's, he's a, he's a really, really um, phenomenal, I mean, he's a phenomenal actor, but a phenomenal guy and he's incredibly open. And, and it was his first day today, actually. And I can see my phone um yeah are you back have you finished um so i think he's i i i, I listen i i i would find thinking back to you know being 24 and, and this being your first sort of movie um i i i am constantly my hat comes off to him because he is he's just he's just incredible how he deals with the the pressure of it and everything but I, but of course, we're all sort of here helping each other out. And Maggie's got together the most lovely like bunch of people who we all seem to get on very well. And um, and so it's a very it it doesn't feel like we're shooting this sort of movie uh, like it, it just it feels like we're just doing it all for fun, really. That cast is just a big group of my favorites right there. I can't wait to see <laughs> that movie. And I can't wait for everyone to experience Bly and to continue this conversation. Because if you couldn't tell, all of this fascinates me to no end. And I can't get enough of it. So huge <laughs> congratulations to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of course. And a big thank you to everybody out there watching this episode of Collider Connected. See you soon with more of them.